All right, so big things today. We're gonna finally start seeing how we can mathematically describe this waveness of particles. Um, so this is kind of big because it's gonna start explaining a lot that we see and going forward, um, it's gonna really help us better understand what's going on with like nuclear structure and, and all this kind of stuff. So. Um, Kind of big, uh, kind of exciting, and it's very mathy. Which, of course, for someone like me, I, I dig that. I love seeing intersections. Um, I love seeing, you know, the math used in places. So uh, that's where we're going to head. Um, but before we go there, any questions you guys have about what we've been talking about, or any homeworks you want to look at? Oh, and speaking of homeworks, um, I did just put a uh, chapter six stuff up. If you didn't see that, that happened earlier today. So um, it's not due until next Thursday, so you've got a week to do it. Um, but you can go ahead and start uh, working on it because it, it covers things that we've already talked about um, for the most part. But anyway, uh, any questions from you guys? No, you just want to you you want to see the uh, punchline here. I've been waiting so long. Yes. <laughs> All right. Okay. So let me go to the whiteboard okay, so I can write some stuff here and show you. So here's what we're going to do. Um, what we want is what's called a wave function. This is what we're going to want to create. And the wave function, we're going to use the Greek letter psi kind of looks like, uh, you know, like a trident, Neptune's trident or something like that. But that's the psi, that's capital psi. And we're going to be looking at a one-dimensional wave function. Obviously, you can do this in all three dimensions. So it would be x, y, z, and t. But because we're just starting off nice and easy, we're just going to go with one-dimensional wave function. Okay, so what exactly is this thing going to be? How do we represent the waveness of um, a particle? All right, well, let's go back to that idea of the, the double slit experiment for electrons. Right, and just like with light, we saw that when we projected this onto a screen or, or we looked at where the electrons hit the target, we definitely got something that looked like what we saw with light, which was a interference pattern. That's supposed to be symmetric, but we'll call it good. And basically, the way we have to think about this, it, we're going to try to create the wave of fu uh, wave function for one electron, right? Because as the electron gets shot here and comes this way and it goes through one of the slits, it's going to show up somewhere on the screen. But the thing is, we don't know exactly where it's going to show up, right? Any one of those electrons. Is going to show up in one of, uh, well, I mean, basically, maybe not an infinite number of spots because there's going to be some limit as far as the angle, but there's going to be a whole bunch of different possible locations where it comes, right? Like this, it, it could come pretty much and just go straight through, but it also might get deflected over to here or to there or whatever. But basically, we don't know exactly where it's going. <clears throat> we'll know where it ended up when we finally see it hit the target and, and we read you know, where it got located. But for any one of them coming, we're not really, really sure. Right? So that means that this wave function, um, it basically has to be something about probability. Okay, It's going to be a function that gives probability. And I'm just going to put here of the location. So this is the first thing that's a little bit weird. 
because now it's the, we don't actually know where the electron is. And I know that that probably feels really wrong, but we don't really know that where that electron is until we measure it, right? Until we actually see it, until we see it hit the target. But all the while, after it leaves the electron gun, we actually have no idea where it is or where it's going until we observe it. We'll come back to that. That's going to be, um, there's going to be some implication to that as well. Uh, Sorry, um, I, I was just going to ask, this is yeah. like the same deal as like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, right? Uh, to that, yeah. Uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle is definitely involved in this. Um, and um, <clears throat> it's sort of a, a byproduct of the fact that this is going to give us a probability kind of thing. But yeah, we'll, we'll address that in a little bit. Uh, we'll also talk about Schrodinger's cat. I'm sure you guys have all heard of Schrodinger's cat, but we'll talk about that. That has to do with this as well. So I just want to be clear with light, we could say for sure we knew where they were going to be, right? Uh, no, not quite. <laughs> No, not quite. Because again, it's a we're talking about just uh, if we're going to go to the same particleness of light, it where is the wave function or where, where is the um, photon itself? <clears throat> Excuse me, we don't necessarily know. Um, because think about when you do the <clears throat> double slit with the laser, that's a whole collection of photons that are producing that image on the screen just like this is a whole collection of electrons that are showing this. Um, where does one photon go? No idea. No, Got it. I, I mean, if we could, if we could like release photons one at a time, which can be done actually, but if we do it, it would be just like this electron experiment where we go, okay, so the photon leaves and then we don't know where it is until we see it hit the target. Right, so um, it, it's actually the same for light. And we'll see, like I told you, we're gonna look at, at how this wave function can actually create photons, or we can see that like a particle coming from the wave. Um, but it, really this wave function is just a, something that's giving us likelihood of the location of an object. Makes sense. Okay. All right. So that's what this thing does. Now, psi itself isn't the probability. Um, I don't know what you guys remember about probability density functions. So let me just kind of bring this up a little bit. Probability. So there's going to be a <clears throat> PDF. Right. different than the file media. Um, but probability density functions, I'm, I'm actually just going to ask you guys, what do you remember about probability density function? It's an integral. Okay, we use integrals to calculate the probabilities. Yep, so you take your probability density function and you, you integrate. That will get you your probabilities. Um, this might be a specific probability density function, but they're equal to one. Okay, so that equal to one, uh, this is kind of big. Uh, well, so first things first, um, probability density functions are always greater than zero. Well, Victor, in math, that's what a PDF is, probability density function. <clears throat> I forget what PDF in something data file, maybe, I don't know. But anyway, so for the PDF, um, whatever our function is, uh, let, let's just say that's, we'll call it f of x, it'll make it a little bit easier for us. Um, what we do know is that f of x is always greater than zero because you can't have negative probabilities. Um, and then what Bradley was getting at is that you integrate from minus infinity to infinity you get one. 
Oh, cool. Thanks, Ralph. Portable document file. Good deal. All right, so think about what this is saying, probability density function. When you want to calculate the probability uh, between two events, um, it's the integral from, or two places, times, whatever. It's the integral from A to B of that f of x. And so if we write minus infinity to infinity, we're basically saying that's the total probability of all possible outcomes. And we know from probabilities, that means that it has to equal one, 100%, right? There's 100% likelihood that one of the events occurs. So um, that's what, when Bradley said, you know, it equals one, and, and it's not specific. That's always to any probability density function. All right, um, there's another thing that we need to make sure uh, that f of x needs to be continuous. I just, if it's discontinuous, then um, it's not actually a probability density function. Okay, so in general, this is about uh, how probability density functions work. And, and you saw those probably in second quarter calculus. That's usually when we start talking about improper integrals. Um, and um, that's usually one of the examples we use. All right, well, anyway, so this is what we're going for. Now, this is going to actually help us with this construction of psi. We're going to kind of use this to help us find that. Um, but we can't use just plain old psi. Because I want you to think about like the most basic function you've ever thought of to describe a wave. Like if I just said, give me a function that describes a wave, what function would you use? Cosine. OK, cool. Uh, I can tell that Bradley came through my class. Cause... Most people would say sine, but uh, as I've told you, cosine is far superior. All right, so you're going to go with the, well, if I'm going to describe something as a wave, we're going to do some sort of a, a cosine of right, um, whatever is going to be in here. Um, the fact that it's got two variables is a bit of an issue, but we could do like a kx minus expand my window, kx minus omega t. So you, you may recall seeing things like this, but you could put a sign or whatever. But think about the issue with this in terms of trying to make this, use this in a probability density function, is that this is not always positive. It's sometimes positive, it's sometimes negative, we never really, you know, it just, it, it varies. Okay, so in terms of what do we do then to make it so that it's never negative, we have a couple of options. One is absolute values. And the other is squaring. And what we, what physicists decided on is <clears throat> the squaring. So we're gonna create this psi and we're going to find out later that it's not always cosine, by the way, or sine. You can have other things that make that. Um, but psi is going to be such that when we integrate from minus infinity to infinity of psi squared, we're going to get 1. Now, when I did this, I just made it so that it's time independent, you know, so that there's no t here. Um, otherwise, I would actually have to do a, well, let me just go ahead and do it. It would be a double integral. Again, pick your favorite order, dt, dx, dx, dt. Um, but if we double in it, you know, if we integrate over the entire plane, we're going to get 1. So that's really how we're going to have to construct psi. Not that psi itself is the probability but psi squared gives us the probability. Okay, so the goal is gonna be find this psi, find this wave function 
for a particle. Knowing that psi is going to have to be continuous, uh, it turns out its derivative also needs to be continuous. And um, we need it such that the integral of the square gets us 1. All right, now we are going to simplify this even further. And we're going to go with time independent. So this is the time independent case. So what this means is no t. We're going to make life a little bit easier. And we're just going to go, well, we're going to look at this where it's time independent. Basically, this is the take a picture right now at this instant of time. What's the probability of the location at this moment in time? Um, so we're just going to do that. So if we go time independent, that means now it's just going to be psi of x, which means we're going to be able to do si single integrals. It's just going to make the math a lot easier. Obviously, if you end up going further and, and take more of this, you'll start doing multivariable stuff. I know that my son um, at UNR uh, just took a quantum class, and they were doing everything with time dependence. Um, it turns out that it leads to differential equations that are partial differential equations, PDEs, instead of ODEs. And we as a group are definitely not at a place where we can do that. So we're going to stick with the time independent case. Um, you could also do position independent, where you now just say, OK, at this one location, you know, how is this thing going to show up in terms of time? At what time will we actually see it? That would be um, a position independent case, which you can also do, but um, it doesn't really match this very well, because we're talking about wanting to know um, different positions instead of different times. OK, so <clears throat> that's the goal. Now, first, let me address the, well, how can we actually see a photon? from wave? How can we actually kind of see a particle from waveness? Well, the way to do that is to add up all kinds of different waves. OK, so um, imagine, if you will, that we just have two waves that we're adding together. All right, and, and they'll be sinusoidal. Okay, so waves like you think of as waves, so cosines right, or sines, whichever. But we're going to add those together. So let's say we've got one function here, y1, being a cosine of kx. <clears throat> um, and then we add to that other ones. So then we're going to have another y2. Um, that is potentially different wavelength and all that. Oh, by the way, I don't know if you remember this guy, K. Let me, let me real quick, as an aside, let me just step back. This guy, K, this is what we call the wave number. Does that ring a bell from last year? Yeah, isn't that um, the phase? Like how many like it's oscillation number okay. so so it's not the phase but it has to deal with the wavelength the the phase is if we add or subtract something off of this it was two pi over wavelength right yeah that is correct the k was two pi over lambda. So um, it's, it's related to the wavelength, 
it's um, basically think about period, <clears throat> how you define period and all that um, from just back in the days of trig, right? Um, this is do that same relationship, except it's now it's not a period because it's not a time, but it's a it's a wavelength. Okay, so anyway, I, I just wanted to bring that back because, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to see that again. All right, so um, you have one of those guys, a certain amplitude, a certain wave number, um, but I'm just going to say that this is a wave number K1. All right, and then we add to it another one of these things. We'll go with the same amplitude just to make life easy, but we'll get a different um, wave number. Um, when you add those together, and we, we kind of saw this with the idea of the beats. Remember when we were talking about um, beats in either last year in physics or just the other day in differential equation. When you add these things together, what you get is a wave that does this. where the amplitude here is given by another wave. That was actually a really bad drawing. It should have been like that. We'll just kind of double it up. All right, so you get something that looks like this if you add two. Well, if you add a third, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth, what ends up happening is that these little sort of wave packets get a little bit more defined. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna add a bunch of them. And what you end up seeing is something that looks like this. And here are your photons. So this right here is a photon. A little bit later, there's another photon. And then a little bit later, there's yet another photon and so on. So here's where those start showing up. It starts looking like if we add enough of these, what we start seeing are, uh, it, it looks like mostly like nothing. There's very little amplitude change. And then all of a sudden we get real quick amplitude change and it goes back to nothing. Real quick, back to nothing. And those are our parcels. Those are our parcels. So <clears throat> that's kind of how we can say that, yeah, we can actually get particles from waves, even with just a simple wave equation, a simple sine equation, sine or cosine, if we add enough of them together, it starts forming little packets of information. That's how I think it is. It's, it's information. It's packets of information. There's a whole lot of nothing, right? When, when we look at what, this bit where there's really low amplitude, you're not going to really register that. You're not going to really see it. But then, oh yeah, you get a bunch. So um, that's the idea there. So that's how we can rectify this um, wave and particle stuff, saying that, no, they really are just, they're coming from waves, All right? So particles aren't different than waves. They're just the sum of a, a ton of waves together are what are forming these photons, these particles. All right, so there you go. So now the goal is going to be, let's find these size. Let's actually find the equations that we're going to use to describe the particles but as waves. All right, so what that introduces now is what's called Schrodinger's equations.
So let's erase this real quick. Start drawing again. All right. So, um, Schrodinger's equation. All right. Now, Schrodinger's equation, there is a time dependent Schrodinger's equation, and there's a time independent Schrodinger's equation. And like I said, we're going to look at the time independent version. Why was that again? Uh, to make the math easier. Got it. <laughs> so th this is going to be the, if we just say at one instant of time, like if we're just looking right now, what's the probability that the particles that make up this pen are wherever they happen to be? That, that's what this wave function is going to do for us. Um, I'll, I'll show you, after I write the time independent, I'll show you the time dependent one. And you'll see why we don't want to deal with it. Now, I'm going to give it to you. Uh, we're not going to actually prove where it comes from. I'm going to give you a bit of a where Schrodinger got led to this. All right. But for this level of class, this is a, it's going to be a bit much to show you where it comes from. Uh, but it looks something like this. And I'll tell you what all these things are in just one second. Okay, so here is Schrodinger's equation. So first things first, notice that it is a linear second order differential equation. It's very nice that this is when this is coming up because we've just been talking about that in uh, 50 Qs. So here's another good example of where the linear second order show up. Um, because again, remember what our variable is. Our variable is psi. So we've got a second derivative. We have just the function itself. We could combine those two if we wanted to. Um, in fact, it's not only linear second order, but it's also homogeneous. Because if I move this e times psi over here, then it equals 0. All right, well, what are all these other things? Now, I don't think we've seen h slash yet. We've seen h, right? Planck's constant. Did I tell you what h slash is? Yeah, last class. OK. So h slash, it's just h divided by 2 pi. Um, that shows up so frequently that they just you know, decided to call it another variable. So it's got h slash. Um, so it, it's just h, but off by 2 pi. Um, that 2 pi shows up a lot. I mean, just look there with the wave number. We've got a 2 pi in it and whatnot. But anyway, so that's your h slash. Um, m, this is the mass of the particle. All right, so that's just the mass of the particle. Obviously, that's our second derivative. <clears throat> now, the u, this is the potential energy. So I'm going to put here the potential energy of the system, because remember, with potential energy, it's always due to something else, right? Gravity, electricity whatever it happens to be. But if there's some potential energy, that's going to be U. And then um, E is the total energy. In the particle. All right, so would you use E equals MC squared to find that? Uh, potentially. OK. Um, you would use E equals MC squared if it was at rest. 
right? Because E equals MC squared is the rest energy of a particle. But if it's in motion, then we'd have to, you know, add other energy into that. But sometimes, yeah, sometimes that's uh, MC squared. Usually not though. Okay, so there you go. There's Schrodinger's equation. So now when it comes time for us to solve this, obviously we're just gonna need to plug in all our various things. And if you know all those, if you know the mass of the particle and the potential energy of the system and the total energy that's in that particle, then we're gonna be able to solve that. And in fact, uh, we already know the methods that we need to solve that. Because we've already discussed pretty much at length how we deal with linear second orders. And we'll do that. We'll actually um, solve one of these. Well, I don't know if we're gonna get to it today, but if not today, for sure on uh, what was that, Tuesday of next week. All right, so that's the time independent one. Now, let me just really quickly show you the time dependent one. And you're gonna see that it looks really, really similar. So again, it starts with the minus h slash squared over 2m. But now this is times the second partial derivative of psi plus u times psi. And then instead of being e times psi, it's actually 2 times h slash. And then this is d psi dt. So in terms of structure, it looks pretty much the same, right? But the big difference is we have partial derivatives now, which means this is a partial differential equation. Um, and so we, we haven't talked at all about the techniques of solving that. Plus, um, I, here's what's kind of crazy about these is when you have partial differential equations, sometimes you can get them where uh, the derivatives are not with respect to the same guy, right? This, this, is, this is a second derivative with respect to x. This is with respect to t. Yeah. So the math on this is considerably more difficult. And you guys aren't ready for that. So that's why we're just going to look at the time independent. But if you take the time dependent and you make it where it's time independent, it changes to this one in black. All right. So that's what we're going to go with. We're going to try to solve one of these. All right, so let's actually start with the kind of the most simple possible scenario here. And we're just gonna look at what about, we have a particle, that's what we call a free particle. Free particle means there's no potential energy. There's nothing else that's affecting it. So we don't have to worry about any kind of potential energy. We're just gonna get the energy itself. All right, so let's see, let's see what happens when we do that. Okay, so we're gonna look at a free particle. Meaning u is equal to zero. All right, so that means that we're just gonna get minus h slash squared over 2m times, I'm gonna write it as psi double prime. We know that we're doing this with respect to x since it's time independent. So this, this will just look better for us in terms of how we see differential equations. And then that equals e times psi. 
All right, so let's move that E over. So again, minus H slash squared over 2M psi squared minus E times psi equals zero. And we'll even go one step further here and make this a psi double squared or double prime plus 2me over h slash squared times psi equals zero. So we just did a little bit of algebra on that. And we get here. All right, so let's think about solving this as a differential equation. So it's second order homogeneous. So we start with the polynomial, r squared plus 2m over, or 2me over h slash squared equals zero. Okay, well, we can solve that far if we move this over and then take a square root. So we're gonna get the square root of 2me over h slash times i. And put the plus or minus. So there's the i because it's negative. All right, well, what does that tell you the solutions look like? Sines and cosines. Wait, what? Sines and cosines? You mean like a wave? I mean, yeah, right. This immediately lends us to, and again, if we call this guy the, the omega, right? Um, that gives us a solution that looks like psi equals C1 cosine of square root of two me over h slash, oh, not t, x in this case, plus C2 sine of the square root of 2me over h slash x. All right, so clearly we see why Schrodinger's equation is gonna work. It's gonna do what we want it to do. But this is one of those like, yeah, hey, look, we solved Schrodinger's equation. We got sines and cosines. Well, it kind of went the other way. They started with the idea of let's make it sines and cosines. What is this equation going to have to look like? And that's where it kind of got derived. Um, in terms of the whole like U bit and all that, uh, this is basically like your potential energy, your energy formula. Remember how your energy is like kinetic plus potential? That's kind of what led to the driving of this. All right, now um, we can actually do a little bit of work with this and see what um, the energy actually has to equal if we use the wave number bit. So here's what I want to do. I want to show you how we can figure out what kind of energy we're going to get in one of these free particles or what the possible energies are going to be. So I'm going to erase Schrodinger's equation for right now. When we, if we need it again today, I don't know if we do. I'll bring it back up. But let's just clear out some space here. So let's take a look at this energy real quick. So we've got the square root of 2me over h slash. That's going to equal my wave number. Or that is my wave number, right? And the wave number, that's going to equal Uh, 2 pi over lambda. So let's play around with this a little bit and we'll find out different energy values. So we're going to solve for E. So I'm going to multiply by H slash 
So h slash times 2 pi just becomes h. So we get the square root of 2m e is equal to h over lambda. So I'll square both sides, get 2m e is equal to h squared over lambda squared, uh, which then makes our e equal to h squared over 2m lambda squared. So when we set this up, uh, the energies that we're going to be allowed are the energies that um, come from the wavelengths of the wave function for our particle. And these are not going to be continuous. they're going to be quantized because you may remember last time when we were talking about energy, energy comes in packets, the good old E equals HF business. And so we're not going to get all possible wavelengths. There are only certain wavelengths that are going to be allowed and they're going to come from this relationship right here. All right, so let's kind of quit beating around the bush here. Let's look at a specific case so that we can calculate some of these things and see what's going on. And so we're going to look at a particle, a free particle, that is somewhere in a specific region. We're not going to allow it to go anywhere from minus infinity to infinity. We're just going to look at a very um, discrete chunk. So um, imagine what we've got is a box and this box is going to have length L. And so our wave is going to be trapped between zero and L. But within there, it's completely free to be wherever it wants. So think about th this is an electron, let's say that maybe is being held in place by something, you know, we've created some sort of an electric field that's making it so that it's trapped between zero and L, but it can be anywhere in there. It can go wherever it wants. So within that box, it's completely free. Outside of the box, can't go anywhere. All right, well, we've already done a lot of the legwork here. But now we can actually start targeting the different possible wavelengths. So let's think about waves that could fit in here. Now, what we're going to need is if we're going to create our psi for our psi squared. So I'm going to do that here in pink. Outside of the box, we have to get 0 for our psi, okay? So the pink here is gonna be our psi of x. Do you guys see why that has to be? Why does that have to be zero outside of the box? Because we're not concerned with anything outside the box, the particle is in the box. Okay, yeah, it, basically the particle can never be outside the box, right? We already said it's trapped here between zero and L. So if it's trapped, in there, it means it's never on the outside, which means the probabilities outside has to be zero. And the only way you get zero by squaring something is by squaring zero. OK, so we know for sure it's got to do that. Now, we know psi can be negative. That's going to be totally fine here. It doesn't necessarily have to be positive because psi squared is positive. But we do know that psi has to be continuous, which means whatever our wave looks like in the box, it's got to return to 0 at 0 and L. So let me just give you a couple of examples of ones that would work. Um, I'm not going to use cosine. Unfortunately, here I'm going to use sine because I want it just to start at 0. But for example, I could have that one, right? That would be a totally appropriate sign that's going to end up connecting and 
making everything look good. Um, but I, it doesn't have to just be that. I mean, I could have, yeah, that's close enough. We'll call it good. Like that one works, right? Again, it's sinusoidal and it starts and ends at zero. And okay, keep doing this with as many twists and turns as you want. Just make sure that we always start and end at zero. Could you do like one, like just the peak of it too? Uh, you mean say, oh, I'm gonna draw it down below because it's less messy, but like that? Yeah. Totally. It starts and ends at zero, right? Yeah. So, and this one, the one that you just described there, Bradley, that, that would be the, that's kind of like the end extreme, right? That's, that's like, there can't be any other ones that are like longer wavelength than this. We can only get shorter wavelengths. So that, that's kind of the extreme of one of them, but. So let's actually think about that orange one. What's the wavelength for the orange one? And we'll go ahead and call this one, say lambda one, because it's the first case. What's its wavelength? Ao. Let, let, let me help you out here. Think about if it extended, because usually that helps us see an entire wavelength. Where would we be right here? At two L. Yeah, it's going to be two times L. So, like, that's the biggest possible wavelength we could get. Now, the it so happens that the green one that I drew here is the next guy. It's going to be our second best case. And what's the wavelength there? Land over four? Or would it be oh. two? No, well, think about it. If I start at zero and I end at L, what's oh, the wavelength? Just L. Yeah, it's just L. OK, so that would be the next case. Uh, let me erase this one that's got a whole bunch of garbage in there. Uh, let me see if I can do that one properly for the next case. So the next case is going to be we want one full wavelength and then another half. So that's going to look like one full wavelength and another half. OK, I think I got it. Whew. OK, so how about that one? What's its wavelength going to be? And believe it or not, my graph is almost to scale. This L. So can you say that again, Victor? I'm sorry. It's half of L, right? Uh, it's not half of L. Think about each one of these chunks is the same size. So we've actually split it into three pieces. And there are two of them. So this one's actually 2L over 3. So I was a good guess, Jesus, but it's not quite 3 fourths. It's actually 2 thirds. If we did one more, I'll go ahead and do one more here. So we get two full cycles. Now, if you think about it, we've got four. If we split it into fours and two cycles gets us there. This one, lambda four, is going to be L over two. So we're getting smaller wavelengths, but they're very specific wavelengths. And I'm curious if you see a pattern here. Can you give me a formula for the nth? one of these. So if I said lambda sub n, does anybody see what that's going to be? Uh, 
I'm thinking the next one might be um, three fourths. Okay, so three fourths. Well, just for lambda sub five, but I'm okay. thinking maybe it's going up by like the numerator up by one, denominator up by two, or in decreasing by one maybe. All right, I like how you're thinking. Let, let me just uh, write this in a slightly different way. And this L over two, let me, let me write it in a slightly different way. Does that help you see the pattern? Yeah, so we do L over N plus there you, there you go. So it's going to be 2L over just plain old N. Right, look at this. So lambda 4, the 4 is on the bottom, 3 is on the bottom, 2 is on the bottom, 1 is on the bottom. So it turns out these are the acceptable wavelengths for this situation. We can only have lambda equaling 2L over N. So it's quantized. Because check this out. You take this energy and you plug that in here. Well, we're going to get that this E is equal to H squared over 2M times 2L over N quantity squared, which we can just sort of move things around a little bit. And you get H squared over 8 ML squared times N squared. And let me put a little box around that because here are our energies. But notice that they are quantized. There are only very specific energies we can get. We can get one of these. So whatever h squared over 8ml squared is. Or we can get four of them, or nine of them, or 16 of them, or 25 of them, or 36, or so on down the line. Is that why physicists chose to square it? Uh, what do you mean? Beginning, like at the beginning when we were deriving the wave function, we said we could oh. use either absolute value or square it to make sure it doesn't go negative. Uh, no, they went with psi squared because it's uh, easier to deal with integrals and stuff if you do that. Absolute values can give you really disjointed things. Um, and we don't really see, like if we're going to talk about waves, like if you did just the absolute value of a wave, you would see this, where that's like a V down there. Oh, as so it's a continuity to, thing. Yeah, as opposed to squaring it, curves it. So yeah, it, it's definitely a continuity thing. Um, it, it's mostly a continuity of the derivative. All right, but now think about this. Think about kind of where we are in the development and what's going on. Um, we had Bohr come out and say, yeah, I kind of feel like I have to have quantized energy. That's not continuous, it's just quantized. And then we have the argument that, you know, like de Broglie going, Okay, yeah, but if light is both a wave and a particle, then why can't particles be both particles and waves? So then we get here and Schrodinger's like, oh, okay, well, I just created this equation and then we, we run it on just a real simple model. And all of a sudden you go, wow, both of those ideas go together. If we do treat them as waves, they are naturally quantized energies, which now actually takes care of all kinds of issues that we've been seeing all at once. 
so this is kind of like finding that one piece in the jigsaw puzzle that all of a sudden connects everything. And you go, oh, now I got it. Now I see how this is going to be built. So this was kind of big. This was actually really cool um, at the time where all of a sudden it's like, man, this is all starting to come together. All right, well, so for this part, this example of a particle that's trapped between zero and L, those are our different possible energy levels. Which means now if we know the possible energy levels, we know the possible Ks, right? Because we can backtrack, put this stuff back in and solve for the K. So let's do that real quick. Let's come back up here. Remember where k was the square root of two me over h slash? Well, let's see what that actually equals. So I'm actually going to jump back to this point right here. Whoops, how about go on that side? All right, so we're going we're gonna to go there. And let's plug in our lambda. Because this was our 2L over n, right? So we're going to get the square root of 2ME is equal to h over 2L over n. So just run that over there. Um, oh, actually, I meant to do this one. Hold on. <laughs> Oops. Check that. I wanted that guy. Erase that. Okay, so we've got the square root of 2me over h slash is equal to our k. All right, well, so that energy, if we put the stuff back in, you get uh, the square root of 2m times h squared n squared over 8ml squared divided by h slash. All right, well, simplify this down a bit. m's go away. The two goes into the eight and the four. And then notice how everything in here we can take a square root of. Those are all perfect squares. So we get H N over two L H slash equals K. All right, well, h over h slash gives us two pi. The two pi divided by two gives us a pi. So we get k is equal to pi n over l. So those are the only possible wave numbers when we're in this situation with a free particle. So if we come back to our general solution here with the C1s and the C2s. I'm going to change all that stuff on the inside. Just make it pi n over L because it's going to make it way easier for us to try to like well, integrate and do whatever else. Okay, so um, let's clear this up, give ourselves a little bit more space. So we've got psi equals C1 cosine of pi n, L, pi n over L times x plus C2 sine of pi n over L times x. Okay, so that's just that thing, but now simplified. 
So before we find C1 and C2, I just want you to notice something about this. I mean, look at what it only depends on. It only depends on the size of the box, right? The where is, you know, how big of a space do we have for this electron to, to be or this particle to be? And I mean, really, that's it. I mean, there is this N. So that as we uh, increase our energy levels, we get a slightly different waveform. That all that matters is the size of the box. But in a way, that's good, right? Because if this is a free particle, if there's nothing else that's affecting its ability to do its thing, it shouldn't be affected by anything. All we've got is the L. All right, so now we just need to get some initial conditions so that we can make this all good. And here are what the initial conditions are going to be. We need psi of zero to equal zero. Because we need to be able to come in here at zero and just get zero. OK, well, if you plug zero in, sine of zero is zero, so that goes away. The cosine of zero is one, so we get psi equals, or zero equals C1. So that leads to C1 equals zero. All right, so that was easy enough. So what we then have is that psi is equal to C2. Well, let me not call it C2 because I would rather just have a, uh, a variable. So let me call it A. So psi is going to equal A times the psi, uh, sine of pi n over L times x. So it is sinusoidal, which is what we knew was going to happen. And it turns out it's just one sine. It's just a plain old sine curve. All right, now, um, if you think about other things we know about this, we know that at L, if we come back over on this other side, at L, we have to be 0 as well. But unfortunately, that doesn't help us find A, because if we plug in L here for x, you get sine of pi n, and sine of pi n equals 0. This always is. So uh, we don't have any more initial conditions to help us find A, because we don't know anything about the derivative. We don't know anything, right? Like, we don't know anything else. But this is where our PDF is going to come in. The fact that this is a probability density function tells me that if I integrate psi squared from 0 to L, I need to get 1. Since it was 0 everywhere else, I know it's got to add up to 1 total. So between 0 and L, it has to equal 1. So we're going to integrate from 0 to L a sine of pi n over l x dx. And then we're going to set it equal to 1. Oh, hold on. Squared. That integrates psi squared. All right, so we're going to get a squared, because that a squared is a constant. We're going to pull that out front. And then when you integrate sine squared of pi and L over X from zero to L, um, what you end up getting is L over two. I will let you confirm that, but that equals L over two. So we can actually really quickly solve this for A. And we get A is equal to the square root of two over L. All right, so we're there. 
we actually now have our wave function for this particle. Psi is equal to the square root of two over L times the sine of pi n over L times x. Well, there you go. So we just used Schrodinger's equation to actually find the wave function for a particle. Now, this is actually the same wave function for any particle in this box, whether it's an electron, a baseball, the moon, okay, it doesn't matter its size. As long as it's a free particle in this container, it's going to have this wave function. Well, one of the wave functions, right? Like technically, I probably, no, I'm going to put a little sub n there because there's more than one it can take on. N can be any number, any integer, any, how about any uh, uh, natural number from one to choose your fig favorite biggest counting number. So any counting number and that wave function is allowed for any particle in this box. But the energies, and I think I still have the energies down here. And if we look at uh, the energies in this pink box. So let me, I'll retranslate that up here. Then the energy, the allowed energies or the corresponding energies are going to be these guys. All right. Well, the other thing that happens here is if we increase n, we decrease the wavelength. Again, come back over here, right? It was 2L over n. So if we want to start getting into the energies that let's say a baseball would have, our wavelengths are going to be minute because we're going to have to have huge ends. Uh, this is going to be a pretty small number. Remember H? What was the order of magnitude for that? Do you remember? 10 to the what? That's negative 3. So it's negative 34, but that, that, that's pretty close. So think about even if it was minus 32, it's still. <laughs> so square that. Now we're on the order of 10 to the minus 68. And then you divide by the mass. Now, let's say we're talking about a baseball. In kilograms, that's going to be on the order of 10 to the minus 1. OK, so we were at 10 to the minus 68. And we divided by 10 to the minus 1. So now we're at 10 to the minus 67. And how about for the length? We just go with the distance from home plate to pitcher's mound, which is 60 feet 6 inches, which is around 20 meters. So let's just go on the order of 10 to the first. All right, well, that brings us back to 10 to the minus 68. So if we're just talking about a baseball being thrown by a pitcher, this amount is 10 to the minus 68. Think about how big N has to be to get us to the energy levels that a baseball is going to have as it's being thrown to home plate. Right? Um, that's going to be on the order, well, the mass is going to be, if we do 1 half mv squared, velocity is going to be on the order of 10 to the first 10 squared. So let's just say 10 to the third for the v squared. 
mass on that's probably another 10 to the minus one. So we need something on the order of 10 to the second. So we're gonna need n squared to be on the order of 10 to the 70th, which means that n itself is on the order of 10 to the 35th. Think about what happens when we throw that in there for our lambda. Again, that's why we don't see it. We don't see the waveness of a baseball just because the numbers are such that that wavelength is so incredibly tiny. Now, if I was a pitcher and you know, all of a sudden my coach is bitching at me because I'm not hitting the right spot. I would probably say something like, oh, dude, that was the wave nature of the baseball just came into play. I, I don't actually know where it's going to be. I can only give you a best guess, but this is one of those really random probabilities where it went to the wrong spot. Uh, I know my coach isn't going to buy that, but it's true, right? And there is a possibility, even though it's not very, very big that this waveness manifests itself and that baseball that gets thrown like if we're in tahoe and we throw that baseball it's non-zero probability that it shows up in texas and it's very 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 small probability but it's non-zero there's the possibility there's the probability that an electron that's in your fingernail right now is on the moon Again, so minute probability that I'd be willing to say that none of your electrons have ever shown up on the moon, but it's a non-zero probability. Uh, but yeah, the good, the, this is why when we start talking about tiny things, we do have to worry about this. Because like, what if our box, for example, was the nucleus of an atom? And we're talking about things that are in the nucleus of an atom. That L is now, you know, really tiny, which then super brings down that energy level, right? But the masses are also small. And maybe our ends aren't as big as we need, you know, and so now it it starts mattering. So this is another nice thing about this is that it doesn't conflict does not conflict with classical physics because if you extend this to the classical realm your ends are so large that the waveness disappears so that's another strength to um, this theory this idea is that it it still holds even in this macroscopic world where physics began all right well we will later do more of this derivation like we will find uh wave functions for other scenarios um and they're not all as easy as this one, right? This one is easy because we said it's a free particle, so there's no U. And we know that we're somewhere between zero and L. We're not going to allow for any other weirdness, right? So this is a real simple case. And I know you might be looking at it going, yeah, there's a ton of math for this really simple case. Yeah, there was. Um, but it just gets more complicated when we extend it out. But we will. We'll, we'll look at some things that are a little bit bigger later. Um, but let's talk about some more consequences of this waveness. Uh, specifically, let's talk about Heisenberg's uncertainty principle and um, the uh, Schrodinger's cat deal. So I think I'm going to start with Schrodinger's cat. You guys have heard of Schrodinger's cat, I'm assuming? Yeah. Yeah. What's the deal with Schrodinger's cat? Is it dead or is it alive? Yeah, it's dead and it's alive at the same time, but not really, but we only know when we look at it. Okay, so here's Schrodinger's cat. Here's how this plays out. Now, let's just talk uh, 
it uh ralph it is actually it is philosophical but it's also mathematical and it's physics um we are in this realm now where everything we talk about in physics is actually going to link to things in religion and philosophy like we'll we'll end up having philosophical discussions in physics just because that's the nature of what's going on here um so yeah schrodinger's cat is definitely a discussion that happens in philosophy but it comes from the physical world definitely wild all right so here's the deal with schrodinger's cat now if we think about what's going on here with this probability stuff right we never really know where the electron is we never really know where the particle is. Like, let's go back to that double slit experiment. The only time, like, how do we know where a particle is? How do we know where the electron is? Because eventually- We don't. We no, but eventually we do, right? When do we actually get to mark, oh, yep, the electron was right there? When we look at it? Yeah, when it hits the target, right? We have some mechanism where we actually record the electron. We, um, we measure it in some way, right? So as soon as it's measured, we know where it is. But even at the instant right before it being measured, being recorded, we don't know where that electron is. So in essence, it's everywhere in its possible locations according to the you know its wave function so it's everywhere until it's measured and as soon as it's measured i i'm, I'm going to use a word that it, it doesn't really work but i'm just going to say it the electron decides where it is Decides probably not the best word because it's not like the electron goes, oh, I guess I'll be over here. But somehow through the act of measurement, we've now determined which of the infinite number of places it could have been that it actually is. <sighs> okay. So with this whole wave function idea, we never really truly know about anything until it's measured. Until it's measured, it actually occupies all possibilities, all possible scenarios. Okay, so this led to the Schrodinger's cat thought experiment. All right, so let's go take a look at him. All right, so here's the setup for Schrodinger's cat. We have a box. And that box is sealed. Okay, it's a closed box. Inside that box is a cat. And yes, all of my animals look exactly the same, but we'll make him a cat because he's got little pointy ears. Little tail. There's our cat. There's a cat in the box. But now also in the box, there is a vial of poison. So we'll uh, make a little beaker here that's got some sort of a poison in it. Uh, but the poison is currently sealed. Um, also in the box is some sort of a radioactive element. And this radioactive element has a, uh, well, let's just say an alpha particle um, that could be released. Now, I know we haven't talked about radiation, the specific types of radiation like alpha, beta, gamma, and stuff like that. But um, when we get there, we'll get there. But here's the thing that this, particle, this alpha particle or this decay, uh, it's kind of the same thing as this like particle in the box. 
All right. So this radioactive element, um, in terms of this idea with the wave function, is that we can think of this alpha particle Um, it can be still in the nucleus or it can be out of it. And nucleus, Jesus. Okay, so just, just I mean, imagine that there are all these infinite number of places that alpha particle can be. Some of the time it's in the nucleus and some of the time it's outside of it. All right, so, but here's the deal with this. If it's outside, that means that decay happened. And this decay, is going to trigger the release of poison. All right, so if the particle is outside the nucleus, that means the decay has occurred and that decay, we set this up so that when it decays, the poison releases. All right, if it's inside the nucleus, that means that decay has not happened. And the poison is still in the container. All right, now, if we extend it just a little bit further to the cat, if the poison gets released, this means the cat is dead. The poison got released, the cat kills over. If it's still inside the nucleus and, and decay has not happened, the poison hasn't been released and the cat is alive. Okay. Cat's still alive. All right, so now let's just think about this. If we do not measure this box, right, whatever measure means, we'll talk about that in a second. But if we don't actually measure it, we know that this alpha particle is everywhere that it possibly can be. Right, it's not until we actually measure it that the alpha particle decides, am I still in the nucleus? Am I outside the nucleus? Okay. All right, so that means that both the alpha particle, the alpha particle is actually both inside and outside of the nucleus because it's everywhere. Well, that means that the poison has been released, but also has not been released at the same time. Which means that the cat is dead and it's also alive. So in the absence of some kind of a measurement on this, the cat is both alive and dead at the same time. Now, if that hurts your brain, it should. Because we don't think that way, right? Am I alive and dead at the same time? No, I'm alive. Right? So the cat is a zombie. Uh, I guess maybe, yeah, uh, the, the undead are dead and alive at the same time in a way, right? Yeah, so I guess it should be Schrodinger's Zombie cat. So 
this is definitely a little troubling. And when all this was going on, well, yes, this wave function seems to work really well for us. So we get all kinds of great like coalescing of ideas. Eh, this is a problem. How can it be that the cat is alive and dead? And like, as soon as you measure that box, so we, we open it up to look inside, we shake it to hear if we hear a cat go, Rear, right? We put our hand on it to feel if it's warm from the cat's body heat or like, all right. Until we do that, the cat is actually alive and dead at the same time. Um, I have a question for you. Oh, I welcome it. What if you put this cat in there and it's just, you know, mowling and freaking out the entire time? Okay. Is that an act of measuring it because you can hear the sound of the cat? Absolutely. Oh, rough. Yeah. Right? Because that's okay. that there is evidence, right, going on. Now, here's where, like, here's some of the things that I start thinking about this. Like, okay, even if we go to the yeah, something's got to measure it. Isn't the cat measuring it all the time? Yeah, right? Right, because like I think about myself. I I definitely know I'm alive. Well, unless we're in the, the matrix world and, you know, I'm just a computer simulation. I, okay, that I don't know, but, um, but like, okay, so is it, who has to do the measurement? does it even have to be a who right like what if snow falls on this box and melts because of the body heat of the cat was the snow the thing doing the measurement right and then this sort of gets that philosophical if a tree falls in the woods does it make a sound kind of thing uh, I mean, that's exactly this. And, and I bet the whole tree falling in the woods philosophical question is much older than Schrodinger's cat. But it's kind of the same question, right? Like, in the absence of me going out there and measuring the tree, it's both standing up and falling down at the same time. Right. So what's funny about that, you remember how I asked you that? Because I had that same question asked to me in my psychology class. Yep. Well, I gave my answer. And the answer I gave was that it depends on how you define sound. Okay. Obviously, that's not what the teacher wanted. I did <laughs> what she not. wanted also, but that's not what she wanted to hear. And she replied to me saying, in psychology class, sound is perceived. Just remember that. I'm like, okay, fine. <laughs> But that just makes me think of this even more. It's like, it just depends on how you want to define it. Yeah, how, like do, what how, is do the, how do we measure it? I don't know, it's up to you. Okay, so in that world, then if we're gonna to go to the, philo in the philosophical sound is perception or is perceived. Well, isn't, uh, I mean, that's observation, right? Yeah. So I guess it would be the same, well then, it, that answer the answer to that question then absolutely has to be then no because there's nobody there to perceive the sound so but um but that's the does it have to be a human that perceives that sound because i guarantee you that birds out there are going to hear it right if a tree falls over there are going to be critters out there that perceive the shock waves of the collapsing tree right but again to get back to schrodinger's cat well what is it that actually has to do the observation and maybe what it really comes down to is that they're just it's always being observed there are always things that are making measurements of this. Um, and so the time scales between observations are so tiny that it's alive and dead only during this teeny tiny time interval, which is virtually nothing. 
And so it's like, oh, at this measurement, it's alive. At this measurement, it's alive. And that infinitesimal time in between, it's not. I don't know. Um, but yeah, you can just imagine that this didn't sit well. It still doesn't really sit well. Um, but the fact that we never really know the state of these particles is a little troubling. Right? Or, well, we only know if we make an observation. Well, anyway, that, that's Schrodinger's cat. So a uh, horrible little consequence of the wave nature of particles. Anyway, so uh, that will keep you up at night if you really think about it. Um, but it, it's kind of a crazy idea that because we don't really know what happens with particles, it's possible to have the scenario where um, both events have actually are actually happening at the same time. All right, well, that's Schrodinger's cat. Uh, let's look, talk a little bit about Heisenberg and his uncertainty principle. Because we've got that too. Uh, so this is another one that you've probably heard of. It's kind of famous. All right, so Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So Heisenberg was a uh, German physicist back in the day. He was actually the one who was uh, kind of in charge of their Manhattan project back during World War II. He was the one um, trying to develop uh, nuclear technology for the Germans. Um, but prior to that, when this was all coming out, he kind of looked at the math on this, and I'm definitely not going to go into the math on this because this is this is pretty gnarly. Um, but started looking again at the well, I, I want to look at say position and speed, velocity, and all that kind of stuff with these waves. Now think about waves. We just have a wave, and and we'll even take a, a wave that's a, a set of a whole bunch. So we get our photon, okay? So there's our photon. Now imagine I wanna know exactly where this photon is. That's kind of hard to do because just by the nature of this with waves, that photon has some size to it, right? So, its size is such that I can't necessarily know exactly where it happens to be. Now, I can make it more defined by adding more waves. If, if I've got more information about the waves themselves, I can make that actually be a bit tighter of a clump. So I know its position a little bit better, but there's always gonna be some sort of limitation on um, where that object happens to be. Well, there's also going to be a limitation on how fast it's moving. Because if you go back to the idea of, of the wave speed thing, um, and wave speeds are dependent upon the wave numbers and all that kind of stuff, well, the wave number is going to be de dependent by how many of these things that I put together. And the problem is they kind of fight each other, knowing the speed versus the position. You need to have different information. Like, think about this. Let's get away from waves. And let's just go to, again, throwing a baseball. If I throw a baseball and I want to know exactly where it is, think about what I need to do. I need to basically take a of a picture of it, right? I take a picture with my phone and I'm gonna know, okay, well, it, it's roughly here. So what I really have to do is I have to decrease the time period 
for me to have a good idea of where the baseball is. Because if the time period is large, over that time period, it started over on one side and then moved its way to the other and it traveled over a large period or a large distance. So if I want to know that distance better, I have to decrease the amount of time over which I'm watching this. Okay, now, but now suppose I want to know how fast it's going. If what I had was just a picture of the baseball in flight, I would have no way of knowing how fast it was moving, right? I mean, just think about it. You see a picture of an airplane. How fast was the airplane flying? No clue. No freaking clue whatsoever. But I have a pretty good idea of where it is, right? from that picture and go, oh, look, it's right above the Arc de Triomphe in Paris or something, right? So I know a pretty good idea of where it is, but I have no idea how fast it's going. So to know how fast it's going, I need that sequence of pictures. I need to have a bigger time period so that I can see how fast it's moving across. Well, if I have a bigger time period, then I know less where it actually is. So those two ideas of knowing how fast something's going and where it is are competing. They're, they're competitive. The better you know something's location, the less certain you're gonna be about its speed and vice versa. All right, so Heisenberg did the math. And he did the math using um, the wave function stuff. And he came up with his uncertainty principle, which says this. Okay, so delta x and delta p, we're gonna multiply these two things together and what they are, uh, delta x, this is the uncertainty in position. And delta P, this is your uncertainty in momentum. So I know I was talking speed, but speed and momentum are really equivalent if you think about it, because um, the mass isn't going to be variable. We can, or are we going to assume the mass isn't variable on something? Um, but if this whole wave thing is true, the product of these is always going to be at least h slash. At least. Now, this has nothing to do with the precision of our equipment. It's not, hey, you know what? Maybe eventually our technology is going to get good enough that we can see this better. Like, this has nothing to do with the technology. This has everything to do with the fact that particles are waves, that there's this wave nature. All right, so we never really know exactly where anything is. Now, to help you kind of even like buy that a little bit better, because I know that you guys have seen the math and everything. So let's just think about this like with from that probability density function idea. So go to probability density function, right? We're, we're integrating in the psi squared dx and we go from A to B to get the probability from A to B. So this would be the probability that we're between any two spots, A and B. Well, what if I wanted to calculate what's the probability that is exactly at one location? At the location A, let's say. If we try to do that, that means we're integrating from A to A. Which is zero. It's a big fat donut. Right. So even mathematically, if you just think of it as it's a probability density function, well, yeah, 
of course you can't tell exactly where it is because the probability that it's at any one specific location is zero. All right, well, it's just interesting that this ties together with momentum. And so the better you know one, the less you know the other. And that's really what this is saying since it's the product is greater than or equal to H slash. Right, that's just saying that the more you know one, the less you're gonna know the other. Um, there's an alternate form of this that um, you, you can actually change if you use the, um, remember the formula that kind of involves momentum and energy. You can use that and adjust this slightly so you get another form that's your uncertainty in energy and your uncertainty in time. Like it's, it's really easy to go from one to the other algebraically. Um, but now this is your energy question and your time question. So basically that how this plays out now is um, if you wanna know better how much energy a particle has, you're going to know less how long it stays at that energy level. That sucks. Right. So that's the give and take here. If you're willing to be a little bit more, you know, eh, I'm not sure exactly what its energy is, um, that gives you a larger time span. But again, it kind of makes sense. Right? You think about things that are going to be change jumping between all these quantized energy states. Yeah, if we're going to be looking over a very long period of time, there's probably more likelihood that it's bouncing between all those energy states. Or if we're going to want to know, yeah, we're kind of at this energy state, that we're more sure of this energy state, we have to shrink the amount of time that we're actually looking at. So. Um, again, it's, it's, yeah, that's part of the shittiness of this is that there's always a little bit of, who knows. Um, and like I said, it has nothing to do with technology. It's not like in 500 years, they're going to go, what do you mean? I know exactly where this electron is. Um, unless there's a change in, in, unless we find out that our model is incorrect and there's a better model for it. But according to this model, it's like, nope, it'll never happen. So I've read stuff where some physicists think there could be something wrong, even though what we have now works, because you know there are these uncertainties. Do you yep. think that there's something potentially missing? Um, I, I definitely think it's incomplete. OK. I do. I, I think it's incomplete. Um, because they're like anytime you get to the yeah this is how it works yeah except for this and this and then you start getting all kinds of exceptions it, it, when the exceptions start getting large in number that's when you start going okay maybe this model isn't the best right it's like if you go back and you look at when they were talking about say the uh, geocentric model the earth-centered model of the universe and they started actually looking at things and, and realizing that, okay, for this to work, then Venus has to have this orbit that kind of like sloops around and then goes back and forth and, right? And they started making these models and they were like super complicated. You start going, okay, no. Like the universe is complex, no doubt about it. But really it's like, the universe wants things to be easy. It really uh, does. If you learn nothing else from science classes and in, in the, your study of science, it's that everything in the universe is all about minimalization, right? So the universe isn't all about having really complicated wild stuff. So when we have to start describing it in really complicated wild ways, to me, that makes me start thinking, yeah, okay, something's not quite right. So I, I am quite certain that there will be another revolution in physics. Um, someone is going to get that 
glimpse that you know be able to see something that nobody else has seen come up with an idea and and it will be fought for, for sure there will be people who will be like no nope, this is a this is crazy um but and i'm convinced that the same kind of history is going to happen where people go okay initially they'll say it's crazy then they'll really start looking at it and then they'll start going oh wow it actually does explain all this other stuff um and then that next group of physicists is going to be uh, looking at that and playing around with it and refining it um, and it will better describe what's going on and then it will probably happen again then it will probably happen again um, but i mean who knows maybe, maybe we will get lucky and there is a grand unifying theory like i don't know if you know about this but einstein that's what einstein was looking for he wanted like the theory that explained everything well, we're we're still waiting for that, but I, I think we got to explore space to figure that one out. Uh, I think that would help. Um, we are definitely limited in that our observation, like where we observe, is pretty small. And yeah, we do know a lot about things that are far away because of our ability to um, kind of reverse engineer, right? But at the same time. I, anywhere you see, when you go out and you look at the stars, the visible universe is a very small part of the universe. You know, so uh, I, I'm with you, Bradley. I'm all about more information. The more information we can get, the better. And whether that information is coming, you know, from an earthbound lab or, you know, probes that we're sending out into the far reaches of the universe or whatever. Yeah, man, I'm all about it. More information is better when it comes to science, no doubt. All right, so there's uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And, and I was about to ask if there are any questions and I'm not gonna ask that because there are so many questions that uh, even I don't you know, truly, like it, it's a little unsettling. What I have going for me is I trust the math um, and uh, the mass says it must be so. Anyway. All right. Well, I, I'm excited here because now I get to share with you one of my favorite jokes. Oh, there's a big screen. So. All right. So, <laughs> Heisenberg, Schrodinger, and Ohm are out driving around in a car. And, uh, you know, they're having a grand old time, hanging out, talking physics, and all of a sudden get pulled over by the cops. So the cop goes, goes up to the door and, you know, uh, Heisenberg's driving and says, hey, do you know how fast you were going? You know, no. You were going 95 miles an hour. Shit, where am I? So the cops like, wait a minute, these guys are weird. I want to look in your trunk. Pop the trunk. So he pops the trunk, goes to the back, opens it up, all of a sudden yells out. Schrodinger goes, oh, we Am I back? Yeah. Okay, damn it. Where was I in the joke? This, this is horrible. He popped the trunk and cop okay. was walking back there. Okay, okay, okay. So. <laughs> oh, this sucks. Anyway, all right, so let's see. Okay, so. Cop's like, oh, you guys are trouble. I'm gonna go back. You pop the trunk. Let me look in here. So I pop the trunk and all of a sudden he goes. Holy crap, did you guys know you have a dead cat back here? Schroeder goes, well, we do now, asshole. Thanks a lot. So now a cop's really pissed. Like, that's it. I'm taking you all in. So Ohm opens the door and just bolts, starts running. So the cop finally gets on him and he's like, that's it. I'm taking you in for resisting. 
right, there's the joke. So bad. <laughs> oh, but it's so good on so many levels, right? Heisenberg's like, oh, you told me how fast I'm going. Shit, I'm lost, right? Schrodinger's like, oh, dead cat. Well, now I know. And then, oh, resisting arrest. Yeah, anyway. Okay, so there's your horrible physics dad joke of the day. Um, but it's a beauty one because it combines so many things. All right, well, I think with that, we'll, we'll end on that uh, <laughs> lovely note. Um, <laughs> it, it is kind of appropriate that, that my screen froze up in the middle of it. That, that does just kind of add a whole nother level to it. So. All right, so with that, we'll go ahead and call it a day. Um, again, just to let you know, there is uh, homework from chapter six. I'll be putting chapter seven stuff up probably over the weekend, just so that you've got that. Um, but yeah, we're just cruising along and, and we'll con continue this discussion of wave functions and what it actually means. Um, and it will lead to things like why radioactive decay happens. All right, well, we'll actually see why that happens according to wave functions, um, why it's random, why we don't know exactly what happens. So um, we can actually describe a lot with these wave functions. So we'll be solving Schrodinger's equations under, uh, or Schrodinger's equation under different scenarios um, and just kind of moving along, all right? So with that, I'm gonna wish you all a very wonderful weekend and I will see you next time.